study your word, to Thank hear you, your Father. voice, to discover you on the pages of the Holy Writ. So that, now, God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and our minds. Help us, God, to uh, hear you and, and, to, and to trust you, Father. Yes, Father. And more importantly, God, to obey your commands. Help us to love you the way that you have called us to love you. Yes. Help us to love ourselves as we love others, God. Mm -hmm. May we bring you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so let's go to uh, the Old Testament. We're going to be in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel uh, chapter 25. 1 Samuel chapter 25. It's a, a slight, I guess, slight deviation from, you know, I generally been in the uh, uh, New Testament, but tonight, you know, we're, we're going to hang out in this Old Testament book of uh, 1 Samuel, uh, just to set us up a little bit. So, David, right, we go back a little bit. David, uh, out of all his brothers, had been selected to be king, right? Um, he was not the one who you uh, expected to, because he was the younger uh, he was small, um, and in his brother's eyes and probably other eyes, he was uh, insignificant. Um, but God sent the prophet uh, Samuel to anoint the king, right? And so he anointed David. But David wasn't to be king that day, right? He was told that he would be king, but his official installation hadn't happened yet, right? Um, and so David went back to doing what he did. He was tending the sheep. He was being a shepherd uh, over his flock. But that created some anxiety, some stress, some anger in the current king, who was Saul, right? Saul had the kingdom taken away from him because of his disobedience. You remember, right? The prophet told him, hey, you're going to destroy all the Amalekites. Destroy everything. Don't leave anything alive, mm -hmm. right? Not even the trees, right? Mm -hmm. Everything, the vegetation, the people, the, the land, I want you to destroy it. But Saul, thinking that he was doing a good thing, kept mm -hmm. uh, the king and some some uh, some of that nobility and the riches and, and all that stuff. Come on, girl. Mm -hmm. All of that stuff alive. Mm -hmm. And God was displeased. Now, some scholars and even just regular old church folk like us may feel like he got a raw deal, right? He made a mistake. Okay, God, I get it. He made a mistake. You ain't have to shut him down like that. But who are we to tell God how to be God, right? And so a pursuit ensues. Saul becomes angry uh, so much so that he's, he's distressed, he's disturbed, he has a mental health crisis. And the, their very one who would replace him was called in to calm him. Mm -hmm. Right? Ain't that kind of interesting how that worked? The Lord had already anointed him and, and said, listen, you're going to be king, but you're going to have to do a little bit of work before you get there. And so mm -hmm. David is in uh, the king's court. He's before Saul, and he would play his music and calm him down a little bit. So it acted like an uh, uh, antidepressant, right? He, he was like, you know, uh, I'll bring you down. Um, but Saul, you know, his, his, his fits continued to the point that he pursued David 
uh, to kill him, mm -hmm. right? But David had something that Saul didn't have, and, and that's this, this heart after God, mm -hmm. right? And so in, in all of that, right, David pursued Saul, excuse me, Saul pursued David, but he evaded him, right? You all know the story or the friendship that was formed between David and Jonathan, Saul's son. Um, you know that David had an opportunity to take Saul out, right? He was in the cave uh, taking care of business, and, and he was getting ready to strike. But then uh, uh, David acknowledged that this is God's anointing. That even though Saul had done something wrong in the Lord's eyes, it was not for him to, to um, exact judgment against him. Right? Saul had attempted to kill David numerous times, but David didn't retaliate in the way that he could have. He honored the Lord. And so he, you know, tore a piece of his clothing off, and obviously that was God's sign as the kingdom being torn from David, excuse me, from uh, from Saul and being given to David. So, we're here now at the beginning of the 25th chapter. So I just gave y'all a little bit of history. We're all caught up. We're now at the, the beginning of that, that, that 25th chapter, 1 Samuel 25. And the Bible, and I got, I got my... Uh, ESV tonight, English Standard Version. It says, Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him in his house at Ramah. So now, right, Samuel the prophet is no longer the voice that God is going to use in this particular season. So it's an end of an era, right? It's an end of a chapter in that prophetic ministry. And, and there's this... This story that, kind of, that that comes after that interested me. And so I want us to kind of look at what happens later. Again, knowing the circumstances, David had just allowed Saul to, to live. Right? He's, he's done that. Samuel has died. And now we get this, this sort of vignette, this sort of like story within a story between David and, um, and this couple, Nabal and and Abigail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, some of y'all know that story. So we're going we're gonna to look at that in context of, of where we are. Hey, beautiful. Where we Ooh. are and what we're doing here as a ministry. Um, there's some lessons. There's some nuggets here that I think that we can draw from. So again, Samuel's dead. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible says, Then David rose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Now Paran is a, a, a desert, right? Mm -hmm. If you remember the story of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, right? Mm -hmm. Hagar ran, escaped, or left, mm -hmm. right, into the desert, right, where, where she took Ishmael, right? Mm -hmm. And she was like, look, I can't take this. That's a whole other story to, to talk Ooh. about, too, right? Just, mm -hmm. It's just... If, if you we don't you don't even need to watch TV. There's drama in the Word of God, right? <laughs> it just is, right? Talk about you know this mixed family, this this you know blended family. These issues. She runs away with her son, and she's in the wilderness. And then God takes care of her like He always does, right? He provides, but then He sends her back. So just for context, that's the wilderness we're talking. It's the desert. So it's the, it's the desert. Um, it's also where Israel had settled during that exodus. So when they came out of Egypt, part of their uh, uh, settling was in Paran, in this wilderness. Uh, verse 2, and there was a man in, in Maon, uh, which is in that region, whose business was in Carmel. Uh, the man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. So it's... It's this time of year, it's this season where uh, he's getting ready to, to make some more money. Let's just say that, right? The sheep, mm -hmm. their, their coats are full. The fur is ready to be sh uh, shorn. Is that, is that how we say that? I don't know. You know I don't really care about that. They're going to give him a haircut. <laughs> They're going to give 
give them a haircut so that they can now make clothing and, and sell it to market and things like that. But see, it, when you're wealthy, especially back in those days, you needed protection. Right? When you had a large, like, like nowadays, you can't, you know, pick a celebrity. Pick his name a celebrity. Beyonce. Okay, yes, Beyonce. Ain't no way we can just ride up to where Beyonce lives and be like, hey, you know, how you doing, right? There's, there's, there's uh, fences and gates and guards and all those other things, right? She's protected. She has enclosure. I assume. I've never been there. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and so for the wealthy in those times, that's what happened. You basically hired out somebody to protect your field, to protect your land from being robbed or destroyed. And that's what's happening here. Okay? So it's, it's sheep shearing time. And David and his men have been under the employ of this man, this wealthy, uh, you'll find out he's from the tribe of Caleb. He's a Calebite. Mm -hmm. But he's a mean Calebite. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, so they're in Carmel. The Bible says, now the name of the man was Nabal. Mm -hmm. Nabal's name means fool. Mm -hmm. It translates to fool. Now, I don't know that, you know, that might be a, a play on his name or a, a, a colloquialism for fool, but uh, looking up his name, it, it came up as fool, like foolish. Mm -hmm. So he's, 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 doesn't mean he has to be, you know, a complete fool, but in his methods and his mentality, he may have been foolish, mm -hmm. as we'll see we continue on. And the name of his wife was Abigail. Now, Abigail's name, uh, Ab, Ab that, that, that prefix means father. So that's kind of like when we say Abba, mm -hmm. right? That's father. And, and the, the other part, that, that Gail, means rejoice. So when we put those together, it literally translates to my father's joy. Mm -hmm. So you got a fool with my father's joy. <laughs> Sometimes it happens like that. Right? Sometimes it happens like that. They're together. Um, hear this the woman was discerning mm -hmm. and beautiful sounds like my wife mm -hmm. I'm just saying for me personally she's a discerning right. woman and she's beautiful right. um, but I'm not harsh nor am I badly behaved because that's mm -hmm. what the scripture says that Nabal was Abigail is in, a, is, in a, is in a class of women that have been like revered right for their uh, discerning discernment for their wisdom, but also for their beauty. Um, so that's that's what's going on. This 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 godly woman, this beautiful godly woman is in relationship with this harsh and, and sort of uh, surly individual, right? He's wealthy. Uh, I don't I don't the, the Bible doesn't give too much background on him, but I assume because back in those days wealth was transferred from from father to son and son to son, you know, so on and so forth. Perhaps he came into his wealth that way. Again, remember Caleb when he came in to the land to, with Joshua and them and said, what did he say? He said, give me my mountain. Right? Y'all remember that? I preached that. <laughs> give me what I deserve. Right? What I've, what I've done, you know, faithfully for God, this is my reward. And the Bible talked about God rewarding him. Right? And then his descendants being able to occupy that land and, and see the benefits of his faithfulness, and, or at least reap the benefits of his faithfulness. So he didn't necessarily like, do this on his own. Right? So that, you know, that speaks to that whole like, self-made millionaire stuff or self-made mentality. None of us are self-made. Nobody on this planet is self-made anything. Right? Only God is self. Right? God, God is God exists outside of time. God is God was neither created nor formed. Um, so he, yeah, not even God is self-made, but but none of us, no human being alive is self-made. When we acquire and accumulate things, it's because God put us in a position to be connected to something whereby we could then grow and build and all those other things. So he was never self-made. However, somewhere along the line, his mentality changed. Somewhere along the line, he got 
full of himself. He started to think more of himself than he ought to. Because the Bible records that he had a bad attitude. He had a poor attitude. So something occurred. And maybe he became narcissistic. Again, these are this that right there is just Reverend Jay reading into the text. I, I don't know for certain. Somewhere along the line, he stopped loving God. He stopped looking at God or stopped looking at people the way that God looked at people. Right? But his wife did. And now I want you to hold that. So sometimes we can be in relationship with folk that, that don't see the same way. And sometimes we're the one that that actually, we're the, we're the grace that God provides to them. We're the ones that are in, the, in their lives for a reason. To help them to see what love is and to see what hope is and to see how to treat others. Because somewhere along the line, Nabal forgot. Nabal didn't remember. Verse 4 says, David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say, and thus you shall greet him. Peace be to you, and peace to your house, and peace be to all that you have. Seems pretty benign to me. Seems like a, a warm greeting, right, Rev? Mm -hmm. seems, seems innocent enough. He wasn't, you know, being uh, stuck up or anything. He said, peace. Right. Mm -hmm. Verse 7, I hear that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we did them no harm. And they missed nothing, at, they missed nothing all the time they were in Carmel. Ask your men... And they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have at hand to your servants and to your son David. Right? So, bottom line, David's like, look, it's it's time it's time to reciprocate some of that 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 love. Right, it's time to, you know, allow us to enjoy um, the rewards for our service, because it was it was right sheep shearing time. It was a festival happening, so it means that the the wine was pouring, y'all. The music was going. The food was being prepared. There was a harvest that had been reaped, and David gives. A very basic um, greeting of peace to you, and then he 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 makes his argument. He says, "Listen, it's time for you all to shear sheep. Yeah, I've been with your people this entire time, and guess what? Nothing's happened to them. They've been protected. They've been safe. They've enjoyed." not having to look over their shoulders to wonder if anything's going to happen to them. Guess what? Their, their houses have been taken care of. They've been able to go and be with their families. Their households are good. All of that stuff. And so guess what? Now is the time where, you know, I, I, we need to uh, settle up the bill. Right? Because there's, right, there, there's, there, was, there was payment expected for the services rendered. You a business owner, you provide a service, do you not expect to be compensated for your, your service? Mm -hmm. I can't hear you. Oh, yes. yes. Or are you just doing this out of the kindness of your heart? No, sir. <laughs> right? And so that's what's happening. He's here, he's like, where my, where my money at? He said, where's my dough? And, and, and. And so it says, when David's young men came, they said all this to Nabal in the name of David. This is verse 9. Then they waited. And Nabal answered David's servants. He said, who is David? <laughs> who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their master. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shearers and give it to men who come from Idol, from 
from where I do not know, or mm -hmm. from where I do not know where. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm. Yeah, so his attitude was basically repugnant. He, he was he was stingy. He was arrogant to, to, to reply, who is David? It, 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 wasn't a, it wasn't like he didn't know David. Mm -hmm. He knew David. He knew David because he, his, his flocks, his herds, his shepherds had been untouched. Mm -hmm. He wasn't unaware that there was someone protecting, <coughs> excuse me, protecting his his assets as it were as a matter of fact why would he even say who was David who was the son of Jesse right he knew who he was oh how do I know this isn't just somebody pretending to be to be uh, David how do I know that you really belong to him does it make sense for me to take the bread from my people to feed you coming from what would be considered a, a billionaire. Mm. Mm. Right? He wasn't hurting. Right. That's like, you know, somebody on the street asking us for five bucks. Mm. Right? Knowing we got a bank account that we can go to. Maybe it don't have a ton of money in it. But we can go back and get a little bit more. Mm -hmm. David's saying, listen, I, I, I'm just asking for, for some for a demonstration of kindness and love for me and my men that have worked and labored and, and done what's necessary and required to help you, to keep you safe. I'm not asking for too much, but his response was essentially a big fat no. And I know, you know, we could, we could, we could, you know, put it in our context. There have been times that we've done stuff, we've labored, we've toiled, We've sacrificed. We've done things out the kind of most kindness of our heart. And when we go and ask for some sort of uh, 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 reciprocation or some sort of compensation, there are times when we get told flat out no. How do I know it was even you doing? How do I know you didn't just hire this out to somebody else? How do I know you didn't uh, lease out the work? And all you're trying to do is collect the benefits. Right? That's what he's saying here. He's doing that. And then comes the wise woman. Somebody say the wise woman. The wise woman. Because the women is wise, y'all. <laughs> Even though he said all of that, it says, verse 12, so David's young men turned away and, and, and came back and told him all of this. And David said to his men, every man, strap on your sword. Uh -oh. Get your weapons. Get your, get, right? Load up. We out. Who he think he talking to? Every man strapped on his sword. And, and every man of them strapped on his sword. And David even got his gap. It says David... Strap, also strapped on his sword. And about 400 men went up after David, while 200 remained with the baggage. Now, when he's saying the baggage, he's just saying that they remained in, at, along the perimeter, right? They were still doing this work. They were still guarding this man's property. But David said, look, I'm just going to take, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a, 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 a caravan with me. I'm going to take a delegation. And we're going to make our way over to old Nabal's front door. And it's not going to be pretty. Because the man said, load up. He wasn't bringing this sword. They didn't have his sword yet. He was bringing a real deal sword. Right? One to leave a, a, a message. Let's just say that. But again, thank God for the wise woman. Because in verse 14 it says, but one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, and, and they said, behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to greet our master. And he railed at them. Essentially, he cussed them out. He talked bad to them. He had a, he had a, it, he had a tone that 
would vex your spirit. Mm -hmm. You ever been in front of somebody and they're talking to you and it just like, you get, it just listening to them makes you agitated? It's not even necessarily what they're saying, it's how they're saying it. Because there's a way to, you know, to, to say things, right? There's a way to say, that's, you know, thank you for that. Um, that is out of my job scope, right? There's, there's a way to, to kind of, you know, get at folks. I appreciate that feedback. I'll take that into consideration. Rather than, I don't care what you got to say to me. <laughs> Who told you to say that anyway? Right? Do you see the difference? Did you see the posture too? You know? God bless you, sis. You know, thank you. I, I appreciate your care and concern. I will take that under advisement rather than, these are my kids. You can't tell me nothing about my kids. Right? It's a different way. So he approached, he approached David from the perspective of, bruh, I don't owe you nothing. And, and better yet, how do I even know you say you are who you say you are, right? He's, he's, he's insulting the man that had been protecting him. And so David, now I'm not saying we respond like David because David got it wrong here. David allowed the anger. David allowed the emotion. David allowed the title. David allowed, the, he got his nerve. My men have been out here day and night doing the work. We've been sacrificing. We've been holding things down. We've done all of this for you, and you got the nerve to, to treat me like this. So I'm going to show you this is how I'm going to repay you. And he said, let's, let's get the sword, right? Now, mind you, David is not the king. Mm -hmm. David doesn't even have the authority to do this stuff. He's not the king. He's, he's essentially acting as a mercenary at this point. So now he has altered who he is. His identity has changed because of the, the language used against him, because of what he felt was disrespect. And the world would, would paint him, right? I'll use our kind of He would paint him as an angry black man. That's what he would be viewed as, right? We would say he's in his right. He was he was in within his rights to 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 defend his name and and, and that sort of thing. And yeah, he was. And we are too in the, in our rights to defend ourselves when we feel threatened or when we feel uh, taken advantage of. But David, David got it wrong. I don't want us to grab our swords. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't want us to rally up and, you know, tune up our tongues because our tongues, even though it's an untamable object, it, it's fierce. It's full of venom. It, it can be, it can be lethal, right? The, the Bible talks about the power of life and death being in the tongue. Yeah. Some of us have been delivered <laughs> from that venomous tongue. Others are still being delivered. Amen. Amen. Okay. Yeah. Well, listen, we are we are we are sanctified, and yet we are continuing to be sanctified. Amen. Right? Amen. We are we are always in sanctification process. <clears throat> so it says, David gathered his men and hurried, but. One young man told Abigail, Nabal's wife, Behold, David sent messengers out to greet our master, and he just acted a fool. He rallied at them. He lived up to his name. Verse 15, Yet the men were very good to us. Mm -hmm. So see, David, what he doesn't realize is he has a voice. Mm -hmm. He's got one that will defend his integrity. Mm -hmm. He's got one that will talk about what he's actually done. Mm -hmm. Because the master is the one that was supposed to be believed. So the master, the head of the house, gave this fake news. He presented this mis, uh, this, this uh, 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 sort of mirage. 
This illusion that David was not who David said he was. Yet this one person came to the defense of David's army, David's integrity, David's character with Abigail. He said, this man was good to us, right? He took care of us. Bible says, we suffered no harm. Mm -hmm. And guess what? We did not miss <coughs> anything when we were in the fields as long as we went with him. Mm -hmm. So surely they felt protected and covered and comforted by this protector. And the message we share is the same. When we're with Christ, when we're in the company of Christ, when we're in relationship with Christ, surely we will experience goodness and mercy following us yeah. all the days of our lives. Yeah. But if we leave, if we are disconnected from the vine, if we are the branch that falls, what happens? You wither and die. Right? Because your life-sustaining power, that life-giving flow, right? That, that bread of life, that, 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 that water, right? Is connected to the vine. So he's saying, look, this man was good to us. We were doing what we had to do. We were so comfortable, we didn't even need to really think about it. We didn't think about the dangers. When you rest in the comfort, or I should say rest in the relationship that we have with God through his son Christ Jesus, you can work and not even worry about your adversary. Because God is the one that's defending. God is the one that was protecting. David was like this Christ type, this archetype of Christ in this example here. He says, we were good they did what they were supposed to do. And so, uh, verse 16, it says, There were a wall, a wall to us, they were a wall to us, both by night and by day, all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Verse 17, Now therefore know this and consider what you should do. For harm is determined against our master and against all his house. That includes you, Abigail. Yeah. They coming for you too. That's your man. <laughs> right, the video, this, this, this is my man. <laughs> I'm going to stick by his side. So they're coming for you too, Abigail. Harm is coming to your house and everything attached to your house. And he is such a worthless man that no one can speak to him. Huh. Mm. Mm. <laughs> So this man was so hard-hearted, this man was so hard-headed that he wouldn't listen to good reason. He had heard that David was coming after him, but like the narcissist he was, he was like, all right, I don't care. But Abigail had wisdom. The Bible says she was a discerning and beautiful woman. She had wisdom. Verse 18. She got right to work. It says, Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and 200, excuse me, 200 loaves and two skins of wine, five sheep already prepared with five sea of parched grain and a hundred clusters of raisin and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on donkeys. And she said to her young men, Go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she didn't tell who. <laughs> Sounds like a smart move to me. Um, it says she didn't tell Nabal. Because, quite frankly, if she told Nabal, what would Nabal have done? Yes. He would have shut it down. He would have told her, no, you can't go. I'm your husband. I'm the head of you. You listen to me and obey me. We ain't giving that so and so a dime. <laughs> Meanwhile, your death is your destruction is <laughs> on the way. It's on the way. Reminds me of 
Christ. Reminds me of sin and eternal separation from God being our lot on the way and God sends this interceptor, this this one that would stand between that which is supposed to kill us and give us an opportunity for salvation. That's the picture that I see. Do you see it with me? Here it is. Abigail stands between the impending death that should be brought on her husband and the entire household and everything that owns it. Think about yourself and where you were before Christ came into your life. How death was in pursuit of you. Sin was rampant and death was on the way, yet Christ was an intervention. Christ stood between death and life, affording an opportunity for you to change your mind. That's really what the, 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 the gospel is all about. That's the message that we're carrying out in the field when we go on our jobs and in our spheres of influence and, and when we connect with people. That's really what it is. Those who aren't saved are, are being pursued by death. And yet there's a lifeline, right? Who wants to be a millionaire? There's a lifeline, right? And his name is Jesus. And Abigail stands in that way. She said, look, get this stuff together. Get these supplies together. That's all they were asking for. In the grand scheme of things, they weren't asking for a lot. These people were wealthy. And so she got it together and sent it away. She put it on the horse, the donkey rather, and sent it away and didn't tell her husband what she was doing, which honestly was a very smart move. Look at verse 20. And, and as she rode on the donkey and came down under cover of the mountain, behold, David and his men came down towards her and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain have I guarded all of this, all that this fellow has in the wilderness. Essentially, I did this for nothing. I've sacrificed my time, my talent, my men are here. We've done this work, and now we're being mistreated. We're being pushed to the margins. We're being denied what is reasonable, right? It was very reasonable to expect that he would get something in return for this, this service, right? And um, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him, and he has returned me evil for good. Verse 22, God do so to the enemies of David, and more also, if by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him. David was playing. He swore to the Lord that if I don't kill all these people, you know, may God deal with me. Now, again, I don't, I don't think David was in the right. David was in the right frame of mind. He was angry, rightfully so. Um, but it doesn't appear to me in this, this exchange that this was an authorized um, it would have been an authorized killing right because vengeance is the Lord's right and God right just because people mistreat us just because people don't you know respect us just because people talk badly about us doesn't give us the right to take the law into our own hands mm -hmm. and to exact the justice that we think. Mm -hmm. Right? This was well before an eye for an eye. Mm -hmm. Right? Jesus had to correct that and say, you've heard it, an eye for an eye. Now, I don't know if this is an eye for an eye. He protected their men they, he, and, and, and the man refused to pay him or give him uh, uh, resources. I don't know if that's an eye for an eye. Maybe he should have just walked away and left them unprotected and said, listen, you deal with it and then see 
right? And, and deal with the consequences of, according to, to, to that. But he's here. He's ready. He's armed. He's, he's out for blood. But again, thank God for the wise woman. Because the Bible says, when Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from her donkey and fell before David on, David on her face and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, on me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. That's amazing. She took the blame for her husband's foolishness. I know my wife loved me, but I don't know if she's going to take the blame. <laughs> you know? put, put it out there like, put it all on me. Right? Or any of us, for that matter. Will we stick our neck out in that way? Put it all on me. I'll take the blame for the foolishness and the folly of another. But see, that's what Jesus did for us. When he stood in the courtroom before God and said, put the sin on me and not them. Let them go free and I'll pay the price. I'll die for the, the, the sins of the world. I'll be the one that takes on the penalty and the judgment for the foolishness of the world, for the sinfulness of the world. And that's what Jesus did. Abigail is, again, standing here in between her husband and the family and David, humbling herself, asking him to not exact justice against them. It says, please let your servant speak in your own, in your ears, and hear the words of uh, hear the words of your servant. Let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow, Nabal. That's her boo. She called him worthless. This worthless fellow, Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Mm. Right? Again, Nabal means foolish. So she's kind of saying like, he got it honest. <laughs> you know, he can't help himself. He's just living up to his reputation, his name, right? He's, he's living that thing out. Um, uh, uh, Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, because the Lord, and remember that L-O-R-D, that capital, she's talking about Yahweh, uh, has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand. Now then let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to you, my Lord, be as neighbor. Right. So she's essentially saying that you don't want this on your conscience. Right? I know what you want to do, but you don't want to do this. You really don't want to kill and have the guilt of the these because really they're innocent. They had done nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. like the 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 you know Nabal's household had done nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. It was Nabal. Mm -hmm. So you don't want that on you on your record, right? You don't want that to be something that God has to deal with you in the in the in the future about. Right? So it's smart to pause and and listen to the voice of God. I'm not even talking about the voice of reason, because sometimes reason doesn't make sense. But God always makes sense, right? His voice is what we listen to. His voice is what we follow. Mm -hmm. And so she says in verse 27, and now let this pres uh, and now let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your servant. For the Lord, Yahweh, will, can, will certainly make my Lord a sure house because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord and evil shall not be found in you so long as you live. She was buttering him up. Right? Can you, can you see it a little bit? She was trying to take his mind off of, you know, right? She was speaking to that, that <laughs> anger. Right? Because David felt disrespected. So she was speaking to that disrespect that he was feeling. That, that sense of entitlement that Nabal had to say what he said and look less or look down upon uh, David. That's where he was. 
She was trying to shore shore that up, shore that up. S H O R E. I know, I'm still you know struggling to speak a little bit, but shore it up. She was trying to sort of soothe and ease his ego. Cause let's be real, mm -hmm. David was a bad boy out in the field as a warrior. Right? He had killed a lion and a bear. Right? So he knew what he was doing. He was a warrior. So he had, you know, it's not like he didn't do the work. So his ego was hurt because he's like, I'm a man just like you a man, and I did this work just like you do the work. Why are you going to deny me just a, a small piece for me and my men? I'm just trying to get what's, what's, what I deserve. And Abigail spoke to that fracture. She spoke to his brokenness and actually spoke into his life, right? As a means of bringing peace between uh, Nabal and himself. And let's see what happens. It says uh, in verse 29, if men rise up to uh, pursue you and to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be found in the bundle of the living in the care of the Lord your God and the lives of your enemies. He shall sling out as, as from the hollow of a sling. Now she's talking about the life. And when the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you, has appointed you prince over Israel, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause or for my Lord working salvation himself. And when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. Bottom line, she's saying, listen, you're going to be great. You're going to get what you deserve. He's going to get what he deserves. And when that happens, don't forget about me. Don't forget about me. <laughs> right? Because she knew what was going to happen. She knew he was going to be king. She knew he would be great. He, she knew that he would, you know, come into this, this uh, sort of position of power. So she just, she, I mean, some folks say she kind of threw herself out there. Right? She was, she was doing a little flirt. <laughs> right? Because, you know, I guess she had a pretty bad relationship with her. You know, maybe she was tired of her husband. I mean, <laughs> clearly she said, you know, I'm married to this, because she called him this folly fool. I'm married to this fool. And I know that God is going to deal with him in some particular way. And after all that happens, I'm still going to be around. So, you know, don't forget about me. <laughs> don't forget about me. Verse 32. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you who have kept me from this day from blood guilt. Right? Thank you for coming and calming me down. Thank you for speaking words of encouragement. Thank you for showing me what I couldn't see because I was angry. Because I was upset, because I was feeling some type of way about this man's response. Now, sometimes we play, we sometimes, you know, sometimes we're on that side as the one that can, you know, talk folk down, but sometimes we're the ones that need to be talked down with. Right? Sometimes we, we're, we're in a position where we, you know, we don't like how folks handle us. And then sometimes we got to be, you know, the one to help restore the balance. Sometimes you got to be the one to talk folk back off the ledge. Because they're getting ready to go over. They're getting ready to do something that they might regret. They're getting ready to make a decision that has life-altering consequences. Right? David, if he had have killed Nabal and his household, may have jeopardized his future kingship. And he would have jeopardized Solomon and all of the other sons thereafter. All of the relationships that he would have had. So she intervenes. She acts as a, a yield sign. And David says, thank you. 
Thank you for your discretion and blessed be you that kept me from this day of blood guilt and from working salvation with my own hands, right? For, for, for acting in a position that I shouldn't act, right? For trying to be God. Mm. Because God is the one that determines it, right? Mm -hmm. 34, for as surely as the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from hurting you, Unless you had hurried and come to meet me, truly by morning there had not been left to Nabal so much as one male. Then David received from her hand what she had brought him, and he said to her, Go, in, go up in peace to your house. See, I have obeyed your voice, and I have granted your petition. So he's saying, Okay, we good now. It's square. I'm not going to kill you, man. I'm not going to kill you, your family. I'm not, I'm not going um, to do anything against you. I will accept this gift that you brought to me, this thing that I, you know, your man should have given me in the first place. And then he says, go in peace. Go on about your business. Right? Go on. Go on about your business. Verse 36 uh, and Abigail came to Nabal. This, this, this to me was, I was kind of laughing. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. If you read it, it just, again, it reads, it, it's just a drama, man, you know? <laughs> and Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. Nabal was so preoccupied, so not worry because that's what narcissists do. They think it's all about them. They aren't concerned with any consequences. They don't care because they feel as though they're untouchable and everything is about them. And if there are problems, it's not their fault. It's the other person's fault. So he's, he's living it up. Eating and drinking, partying. It's the feast time. I'm, I've got my sheep shears. I've got all of this, you know, inventory coming in, cash flow. I'm good. Let's throw a party. Right? And Nabal's heart was merry within him. He was drunk. Right? It was merry within him. When you, you know, you, you're intoxicated, you know, your inhibitions are lowered. They're, pretty much non-existent. So he was, he was happy. So she told him nothing at all until the morning light because it ain't no sense talking to a drunk. He not gonna remember what you said. Or they, I should say, let me not, let me not genderize it. They are gonna remember what you say. So it says 37, in the morning when the wine had gone out, mm -hmm. So he's, I don't know if he got an angle, but you know, it had escaped his system. <laughs> his wife told him these things, and his heart, the Bible says, died within him. What? You did what? You gave him what? Why you do that? Now you make me look like a fool. I'm the man of this thing. You obey me, you listen to my voice. Here you go, trial a line off somewhere, <laughs> go give him all of this stuff. It says his heart died. Do you understand what that means? His heart died. His heart turned to stone. It was already probably stony. It says his heart died within him. And he became as stone. And, 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 and here it is, verse 38. And about 10 days later, the Lord, Yahweh, struck Nabal, mm. and, he, and he died. Mm. Mm. 10 days. And then he died. Y'all remember what, he, what, what she said? Remember, hold on, what, what did she say? And when the Lord has dealt with my Lord... Mm -hmm. Meaning my man, when God punishes my man, when God does whatever he gonna do, mm. remember me. <laughs> Cause Abigail was beautiful. And she was smart, she was discerning. 
right? Who wouldn't want a woman like that? Again, remember me. Remember, remember me. Well, he dead now. Nabal's gone. He had a party. Heard what the Lord, heard what she did. And he died before he died. Mm. Right? He died spiritually before he died naturally. Wow. Because that's what anger does. That's what hate does. That's what jealousy does. That's what envy does. That's what disobedience does. When we withhold from others and we are have the power to, to provide and to give, right? Not only do we kill the, uh, the individual in need, we kill ourselves. We do harm against ourselves. And so Abigail went out and, and did what she needed to do to help out. So the Bible says he died. Verse 39. When David heard, somebody say when he heard. When he heard. When he heard Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord. <laughs> he said, Blessed be the Lord who has avenged the insult I received at the hand of Nabal. Now this this isn't a bad thing to say per se. I mean, he's basically saying, thank God the, I, I allowed the Lord to do it. Then me. Right? It's not like he was celebrating like, yeah, Nabal's dead. <laughs> That's not what he was saying. But thank, I, thank God I, I, I put it in God's hands. And the Lord was the one that took care of business. It says, Avenge the insult I received at the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant, <clears throat> excuse me, from wrongdoing. So clearly David understood that what he was going to do was outside of God's will. That he was not supposed to get uh, uh, revenge through shedding blood. And that's a word for some of us tonight. I don't know, maybe all of us, but that's a word for us. Because some people have hurt us. Some people have mistreated us and done us to, so wrong that we want blood. But then we have the responsibility or the weight or the guilt or the shame of that blood. Unjustified. Right? So he stepped back, he let God handle it. And he said, okay, God, I see. I should have just put it in your hands in the first place. So I'm, I'm, I'm good to know that God took care of it and prevented me from being on the wrong side with God. The Lord has returned the evil of Nabal on his own head. Then David, <laughs> then David sent and spoke to Abigail. <laughs> Bless you, to do what? He said, come on, boo. I remember what you said. You said when the Lord, right? When the Lord has dealt with your Lord, don't forget about you. I ain't forgot about you. I can't forget about that face. I can't forget about what you did for me, how you showed me kindness, how you showed me love, how you took care of my men even though your husband, which honestly, back in those days, she could have been punished for going against her husband. But the Lord worked everything out in the way that he would have it done. So David called her. He got on the phone, sent her a message, and said, come on, girl. Come on, be my wife. And, and, and look what happened. It says in verse 40, When the servants of David came to Abigail at Carmel, they said to her, David has sent us to take you to him as his wife. And she rose and bowed with her face to the ground and said, Behold, your handmaid is a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. And Abigail hurried and rose and mounted the donkey, and her five young women attended her. She followed the messengers of David and became his wife. Wow. 
She became his wife. All because she loved God and loved others as herself. Nabal refused to love others as he loved himself because he didn't love God. And if he did love God, God was in competition with other things. Right? He was proud of what he had acquired. He was proud of his wealth. But he should have been much prouder of his wife's wisdom. Because even... Even in his folly, God afforded him grace. You see it in the text? When she came back and told him what she had done, rather than becoming hard-hearted or turning to stone or dying, he could have repented and thanked God for a wife like that or a person like that who would intervene on his behalf to provide uh a solution that would prevent him from being killed. Mm -hmm. So the grace of the Lord is always present. But we and others have to be careful to see it when it's there. To not over, you know, to, to, to not just run past it. Because that might be it for us. Or for someone else. So may we be like Abigail in this season. May we intercede on behalf of others who are under the threat of death, who are, are dealing with sin in such a way that it's pulling them towards the pit. And may they see the light of Christ in us and turn from their wickedness and turn from their hard-heartedness and not be like Nabal and become angry, become envious, become jealous, but that they would see God's grace, his hand of grace and, and mercy upon them and receive the gift of his love. Because that's really what Abigail was helping out in this text. She was a archetype of Christ. She was the one that would stand between the evil that was pursuing, the hate that was pursuing, and the love on the other side of that that was available. Amen? Amen. 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 Questions, comments, thoughts, concerns? Yes, you, young lady with the mask? No? Yes, sir. Um, the the piece that struck me is that Nabal was partying up like he was the king and rejected the one who was going to be king. They knew because the Bible tells you before this story that word spread that David was selected by Samuel and was anointed and all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. him, him taking out Goliath. All of this was common knowledge. As you, as you pointed out. And so it, was struck, it struck me as really interesting <laughs> that he's playing king mm. and rejecting the one that's going to be king. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece was that um, if David had acted as he had planned to and exacted his revenge, his revenge would have swept up a whole bunch of innocent people mm. because of his his own feelings and emotions but God was not about exacting that toll on everyone he dealt with Nabal and that was it and so I'm hopeful that when he thanked God and thanked him for you know, exacting that revenge but it, that he also thanked him for not overdoing it because you know Abigail saved all of those other people mm -hmm. Yes, she. We don't really understand the collateral damage that occurs because of one, you know, because of that one thing, that one, that that one 
turn, that one word, that one act, right? How it could negatively impact your immediate family and then the generations to come thereafter. So yeah, thank God that David had sense enough to hear God's voice through Abigail and to withhold and restrain his ego, his desire to, to you know, seek revenge and provide the same forgiveness, the same grace and mercy that God had afforded him and his family. That's kind of something that, that's not kind of, that is something that holds us to. When we can remember how God didn't exact the full justice that we should have received, then we can also not exact the full justice or whatever, or even be so go so as far as to, okay, God, it's in your hands. A lot of times we need to say, God, it's just in your hands. You got to do this. Because if I do this, Lord, it's going to get messy. It's going to get messy, and I'm going to, it's just, it's not going to be good. So thank God for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> God for sending us people like Abigail to interrupt our path towards destruction, towards devastation. Towards collateral damage. Amen. Amen. You good? Yes. Thank you. All right. Well, if everybody, if we're all good, let's let's stand so we can uh, be dismissed. Um, I know there's there's rehearsal after this. Tomorrow is our evening of love. Everyone is invited. Right? I think it's still a hip hop theme. Bring a cover bring a covered dish. Um, is it adults uh, 18 and yes. over, I'm sorry. 18 and over. Um, so um, yes. Just wanted to share those those quick things. But also, uh, tonight let's we're, we're gonna lift up our Pastor Emeritus. Um, he has to have another surgery, uh, an emergency surgery, as a matter of fact tomorrow morning um, there's still something going on uh, but we're hopeful and, and prayerful right that the Lord has everything under control Amen. and that he's going to do well and, and yes, you know yeah. recover um, so let's keep him in our prayers uh, Sister Glenn is here good to see you uh, Brother Richard mm -hmm. is steadily improving um, yes, getting better yeah Doing very well. Hopefully, home. Maybe another week. Right. Yeah. Amen. Right. And so we'll continue to to lift him and, and, and everybody. And again, just thank you all again for your prayers uh, for me and my family. Um, mm -hmm. Because you know, illness. We're not immune to illness. We we just we, we all are subject to dealing with sickness at some point in our lives. And for me, this is with my turn. So. Mm -hmm. I don't complain, but I just thank God for people who are willing to step in and, and support, and, and I thank each one of you for doing that. Amen. Amen? All right. Let's pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for this evening, God. Thank you, Lord, for your word that is true. Thank you, Father, that you have given us the opportunity, Father, to uh, hear your voice even when we feel wrong, even when we feel rejected, even when we feel, Father, that we deserve uh, retribution, God, thank you for sending an intercessor. Thank you for sending someone to stand before us, God, and, and talk us down, to, to help us, God, to remember who you are and to help us, God, to not go down the wrong path, Father, but to trust that you have everything under control, that, God, you will restore any and everything that have been taken away from us or God that you are the great provider that you are the healer and the deliverer God that you are the conqueror of all things God um, so we don't have to worry or be concerned when 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 wickedness and evil seem to be prevailing or the response is negative or uh, the reaction is is not something that we uh, would have hoped for 
God, we put all our trust and confidence in you. Yes, we thank you for our Abigails. We thank you for the ones that have the wisdom and the discernment to hear your voice and to speak your truth, God. Yes, to tell us that which you would have us to hear. And Father, may we be as discerning and as wise to receive it and to obey it, God. Yes, so that Lord. we stay protected. So that Hallelujah. we remain in a secure uh, station and position yes, in a relationship with you, God. Father, we lift up to you, Pastor Emeritus. Yes. We thank you, God, again yes, for his God. life and living. We ask, oh God, that you have yes, already God. touched the surgeon and touched the medical yes. professionals that will handle yes. him, God. Yes. We pray for a speedy and safe recovery. Yes. We pray, yes. God, that you would keep First Lady Emeritus that you would guard her heart, God, keep her mind stayed on you. Whisper in her ear, God, that you are not left her nor forsaken her, God. God, that she can trust that you got everything under control, that nothing is out of your purview, Father. We thank you for Brother Richard's healing and deliverance, God. We thank you that he's in recovery and that he's continuing to do better each and every day. We pray for Sister Glenda, God, again, and thank you for her presence here tonight. Thank you, God, that you are keeping her strong, and thank you for her family. Thank you, Father, that there, if there, there is, is, is nothing, God, that we can't find in you, Father. So if we, we need love, we can find it. If we need hope, we can find it. If we need a peace, we can find it, God. Whatever we are in need of, God, we know that we can find it in you. So thank you, God, for this gathering of saints tonight. Thank you, God, for this lesson. We pray, oh God, that we would not allow it to fall on deaf ears. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let us not only be hearers of the word, God, but doers of the word. May we take this and apply it to our lives. And God, you, at the end of this day, get all the glory, honor, and praise because you and you alone are worthy of it. Now, God, we ask that you would take us from this place, but never from your presence. May we leave safely, Father, and arrive at our separate destinations to find our homes in the same, if not better, condition than when we left. And God, be it your will, we will gather once again to praise, honor, and glorify your holy name. Yes. It's in the name above every name, the only name that matters, the name of yes. Jesus, who is true yes. and certainly the Christ, we pray. Yes. And we said amen. 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 amen.